even with Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, this team that looked like it was Super Bowl quality couldn't make it to the Super Bowl. So how far away is this version of the Green Bay Packers from getting to the big dance? And what pieces do they already have in place that could help them get there? All of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So I was thinking about, well, a lot of things, but I was I was looking at this roster and we've been talking about the roster compared to these other teams And I'm like, you know, this roster isn't that different from 2020, 2021, aside from Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. So aside from its two best players, it's not that different. I don't mean just in players. I mean in player quality. This roster is very underrated right now. I was looking at the ESPN, did a... a, Roster list. I, I think I mentioned this on another show. The Packers are behind the Bears, which is just freaking madness. I don't. It's it's Mike Clay, who I think is really good at the fantasy stuff, and Seth Walder, who I think is really good at the analytics stuff. And I just don't get it. I don't understand how they came to that conclusion. We're not going to go there. Nate Teich and Robert Mays for the Athletic went back through the Super Bowl teams going back to 2011, trying to find trends. What do these teams have in common? And they replaced some of the um, the multi-time winners with the teams that they faced. So the Chiefs, they've won it a couple times. So let's look at the Eagles. The Patriots, they won it a bunch. Let's look at the Falcons. And a couple different trends emerged. They looked at the number of elite players on those teams. Um, Daniel Jeremiah has a, a, a saying about what he thinks you need to have X number of playmakers on offense, X number of playmakers on defense. So they looked at elite players and really good players, basically blue chip players and red chip players, if we're just going to simplify it. And then they looked for trends. And what they found is the number of truly elite players is not the signifier. It's actually the collection of elite and really good players, the blue plus your red chip players. The the trend was seven to eight, which is, you know, look, almost half of your starting lineup, right? You have 22 starters, I guess a third, a little more than a third, but eight is a good number of players. Now you don't need an elite quarterback necessarily, but what you need is a quarterback capable of, of playing at an extremely high level in the postseason. Joe Flacco, I'm sorry, not an elite quarterback. Eli Manning, not an elite quarterback. Peyton Manning, when he won in 2015 with the Broncos, not an elite quarterback. Russell Wilson, when they won the Super Bowl, at that point, was not an elite quarterback. Nick Foles, not an elite quarterback. But in almost every case, those guys got extremely, extremely hot. That Joe Flacco run is underrated to this day. He was unbelievable. Nick Foles was unbelievable in in those three games or whatever it was. You need an offense that can get hot, a quarterback that can just take over. 
They also found offensive line continuity. You didn't need a bunch of great players, but no big holes. Okay? That's good. Easy enough. Um, And then pass rush. These teams tended to have at least one guy who could either get hot or just was flat out a dominant player on the edge. And if you look across, a lot of these teams had guys who would get or average five pressures a game. Over four games, you get to 20 pressures. Um, three games, 15, whatever, you know, however many you play, if you get the buy, et cetera. So this Packers team, do they have seven or eight really good players? Well, David Bakhtiari is an all-pro. He was really good last year, understanding that some of these health questions are there. He is really, really good still. Jerry Alexander is an all-pro. We know without question, he's a top five corner in the league. All pro. I I, I know that like, I'm going to get some pushback on this, but Keyshawn Nixon was an all pro. And last year was essentially the only full-time, and and he wasn't even full-time the whole season, but the only full-time return man who mattered. He, He swung multiple games for the Packers last year. And he's the kind of player that like if the 2021 team or the 2020 team had, they might have another Super Bowl ring. Aaron Rodgers might still be in the building or he might be, you know, out in Malibu chilling because he felt like he's done everything he needed to accomplish. He has nothing else to prove. And now he can just do ayahuasca at his leisure. But he's an elite return man. I don't, we don't know how he's a slot corner. He's an elite player. At, a, at one of the in one of the few guys at his spots that can actually swing games and and impact winning. Devondre Campbell was an all pro in 2021. I got some pushback on the show yesterday. Okay, it's an outlier for him. He was a fine average player most of the rest of his career. Okay, but he was awesome in 2021. Legitimately awesome in this system on this team. And I, I think was fine last year most of the year. Did not look quite as athletic and fast. And I don't don't think that's an age thing. He wasn't healthy. So, okay, that's four players already. Elton Jenkins has made a Pro Bowl. He's a Pro Bowl player. We saw it at the end of last year when he was getting back to full strength. The last, I think it was six, eight weeks. Lockdown. Aaron Jones, Pro Bowl player. Really, really good. One of the most underrated players in the league. And then Rashawn Gary. He should have made the Pro Bowl in 21. A joke that he wasn't in it. But his pressure rate was elite in the league. He is the kind of guy who's capable of being dominant for a playoff run. Was outstanding against the Rams three years ago. Was incredible in that 49ers game. Was dominant in that game. He is the kind of talent. Now, we're going to see what he looks like post-ACL, all of those things. I understand that. If we just sort of assume that the Packers are not Super Bowl contenders this year, it kind of doesn't matter if he's back this year to 100%. I'm not willing to just write that off in the NFC, given as wide open as I think this NFC is. But from a player standpoint, they seem to fit now. We're going to talk more about the offensive line continuity. So I don't want to step on that. The last part of this is do they have a quarterback? Do they have a passing game that can get scorching hot? We saw Sean McVay go to a Super Bowl with Jared Goff. Now, they had really good skill talent on that team. Sean McVay calling plays. A really good offensive line. Andrew Whitworth, with all that stuff. The Packers have, I think, the offensive line and the run game to, to be really, really good. We just don't know about Jordan Love. And so that's what we need to see. That's what we need to see. What does Christian Watson look like? Well, there, there's not a trend in here that the receivers need to be elite. The passing game needs to have the potential to be elite. Tom Brady won multiple Super Bowls 
with meh pass catchers. Russell Wilson won a Super Bowl with pretty meh pass catchers. Not even, not even the first one. The the Peyton Manning one, where that was that was all defense. The 2014 one, it's a, there's no elite pass catcher there. The Eagles won without an elite pass catcher. Zach Ertz was really good that year, but they had three tight ends who were good. Alshon Jeffrey was their best receiver. Not a special player, especially at that point in his career. Was not what he had been in New York, or excuse me, in Chicago. So what we need to see is it from Jordan Love. And we, and we don't need to see it first in the playoffs. Again, that's not part of this. Because Jalen Hurts hadn't showed it in the playoffs until this team is is absolutely cooking people. We hadn't seen it from Nick Foles until Nick Foles is thrown for you know five thousand yards in the Super Bowl. I think the Packers are, from a roster construction standpoint, closer than people realize. They were closer last year than people realize. Now they they do not have the talent on their roster, or at least they don't have the quality of players yet on their roster of a team like San Francisco, a team like Dallas, a team like Philadelphia. I think that is the that is the tier right now. That group. That's the only three, those are the only teams in the NFC who I feel like talent-wise are clearly, clearly ahead of Green Bay. Can this offense be combustible enough to make a run at a Super Bowl? That is what they have to prove. That is what we have to find out this season. And one of the things that could allow them to get there is the fact that this offensive line finally has some continuity. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Before we do, today's episode brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your job faster and for free. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering hires versus leading competitors. You don't want to, like, have you ever searched for a job and gotten job alerts and you get alerts for jobs that you're just like, what is, I don't, I don't want this. Well, the hiring process can be the same thing. You can get sent candidates where you go, I don't want I don't want this. But that's why LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to make it easier for you. They help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Every dayers, we're back on the show tomorrow. Happy 4th of July to uh, everyone out there, but we will be coming back with you on the 5th for a lot more Packers content. Come hang with us. So the offensive line, a couple things here. Everydayers will know that this is an important thing to me. Offensive line is a weak link system. It is about the worst player on your line, not the best. Go back to week one of last year. You got Jake Hansen starting. You got Royce Newman starting. It it wouldn't matter if you had had Jonathan Ogden, Larry Allen, and Dermani Dawson on the left side. If the right side of your offensive line, if you're under 30, Google those names. If the right side of your offensive line looks like that, you're going to have a problem. Go back a couple years and think about what the offensive line looked like when they had David Bakhtiari and Corey Lindsley. But then at right guard, you have no one. You're starting Justin McCray and Byron Bell and guys who were just not starting caliber players. Go back even further when you had to play Don Barclay at right tackle and he's just getting eaten alive. One player can sink your group. It is about what you are as a group and it is about continuity. And this is something I, I, you know, after I put out the episode about rosters, I got some pushback from Bear fans. Oh, go look at the pro football focus numbers and this versus this player, this person, this, this. So no, no, 
That's actually not how this works. Go look at how the offensive line performs as a whole. And Green Bay's offensive line last year, for all of the craziness and all of the machinations it had to go through, for all the versions it had to be, they were an above average, not just an above average, a top offensive line. Now, Aaron Rodgers helps that, but Pro Football Focus, by the way, they have been as loud as anyone banging the drum that sacks are a quarterback stat, that you control that. Aaron Rodgers has always held the ball a little bit longer than a lot of other quarterbacks because he's trying to push the ball down the field. He's trying to create those big plays, and he has supreme confidence in himself to make those plays. More on Rodgers coming at the end of the show. But this offensive line, even with all those issues, performed at an elite level, a top 10 level in the league last year. They go into the season. David Bakhtiari is healthy, playing his position. Elton Jenkins is healthy, playing his position. Josh Myers is healthy, playing his position. And John Renan Jr. is healthy, playing his position. And you have a right tackle competition between Yash Nyman and Zach Tom, two guys who have proven they are starting caliber players in the league. So whoever starts there, it's, by the way, someone who has already started there before. They all know this system. They've all played together. You have continuity. That is essential. If you go back and look at the percentage of snaps played by the same groups, two of the top three teams whose offensive line played the most together, the Chiefs and the Eagles, And you go, okay, well, they were the most talented teams. Sure they were. But that Eagles offense did not look the same when Lane Johnson wasn't out there. We saw what the Chiefs, without Eric Fisher and Mitchell Swartz, in the Super Bowl against a really good team, looked like. We saw what the Bengals looked like when they did not have their offensive line out there. They had injuries too. Joe Burrow, man, he's an awesome player, but he loves to hold the ball. You need to protect him. Coming in with that continuity is so vital. Not because the Packers are going to make some Super Bowl run, but because it is essential in the evaluation process of Jordan Love that he gets a fair shot. You hear this all the time from Bears fans, the complaints, the, oh, Justin Fields hasn't been put in a position to win. That offensive line was so terrible last year. And if you look at some of the underlying numbers, like they weren't good, but it's not like they were all time bad. Like to justify the badness of the passing game, you'd have to go, okay, this is the worst offensive line we've ever seen with the worst group of skill players we've ever seen. And that's just not what happened. It's just not what happened. So I don't think... We should be undervaluing for the Packers how important this continuity is, how important health is, and how important depth is. Whoever doesn't start at right tackle can play whenever David Bakhtiari can't, if he can't. And we already have seen Zach Tom. If you need to start a left guard, he can. You need to start a right guard, you can. He's he's learning The ropes at center. Royce Newman is someone who started a full season of snaps. Is that a preferred starter? No. And in fact, once the postseason came around, he was benched. But that's a really nice swing guard to have. You still have a top 100 pick in Shane Ryan. Or Sean Ryan. Shane Ryan is a golf writer. (laughs) You have Rasheed Walker, who is a developmental player that I think has a lot of upside. A lot to like there. Caleb Jones, a developmental player with a lot of upside. This offensive line not only has continuity, it's really good. There's a lot of really good players with pedigree, with talent, with ability. And so if you're going to make the argument for why this can work this year for the Packers, one of the big ones offensively is this offensive line is really good and 
for as good as they were last year, and they were really good last year overall. It's easy, in fact, not just not out of the question, it's easy to imagine them getting better this year because they come in healthy. Now they have to stay healthy, all those things, but that's where the depth comes in. And that's where what we saw last year, the ability to juggle all of that stuff. I've had some misgivings about Adam Stenovich and Matt LaFleur and some of the decisions that they made with the offensive line in these big moments in playoff games. I've talked about it. The 2021 decision I thought was bad. The 2020 decision I thought was bad in the postseason to not let Elton Jenkins start a tackle, to not let Billy Turner start at right tackle and play Yash Nyman at left tackle against the 49ers. Those decisions were not my favorite. To open the season, Jesus, to open the season with Royce Newman at right tackle and Jake Hansen at right guard instead of Zach Tom. I mean, what? Dear God, what, what was happening there? Play Royce Newman at right guard. Play Zach Tom at right tackle. I said this in the preseason. Royce Newman should not play over Zach Tom under any circumstances. Guess what? That was right. I don't know how they, I don't know what they saw. I just don't. So that continuity, I think, sets this team up in the best position it can be in from that standpoint to give Jordan Love what he needs so the Packers can, at the very least, get a good eval on him. And that's crucial. All right, we're going to finish up here in just a second before we do. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Every dayers, go check out The Leap. We are doing a lot of fun stuff over there. Um, we've started our roster kickoff series. So we're going through the whole roster, breaking down the players, guys who we think are going to make the roster, guys who are probably going to be left on the outside. Um, Jason published his first piece um, there yesterday. We'll have another piece on Wednesday. We'll have another piece on Friday. Also, please go check out Locked On Sports today. It's all the biggest stories in sports. This is a great time to get in because we're going to get you up to date on the NBA, all the free agency, all the madness, Dame Lillard, all that good stuff. Um, And we've got baseball season and the NFL this month. This month, the NFL is back. The NFL is back, baby. So we're going to get you caught up to everything going around the NFL on Locked On Sports today. Last thing. Um, Warren Sharp of Sharp Football Stats had a um, a stat that he tweeted out. 35 quarterbacks had at least 150 attempts last year from the pocket. By EPA, estimated points added, Justin Fields was 35th out of 35. Okay, let's put, a, put that to the side. Let's just put that to the side. I just had to mention it, but let's just put it to the side. Aaron Rodgers was 27th. 27th. There's 32 teams. He was 27th with at least 150 passing attempts. 27th from the pocket in EPA per attempt. I don't want to hear about the passing yards. I don't want to hear about the passing touchdowns. We have a mountain of evidence about all this. And I don't, I don't know how much of it was attitude, but I will say this. Albert Breer was on Snow News Day with Kevin Clark, friend of the show, Kevin Clark. And what Albert Breer said was the Jets think that they are getting a different player from the one the Packers got last year. If for no other reason than they feel like he's locked in with the Jets. Not locked on, locked in. And that they didn't feel like he was last year and that explains the decline. Okay, so that's what the the team that traded for him thinks that. And Albert Breer reiterated what had previously been reported And what I have said on this program for, what, two years now? That the team has not been thrilled with some of the buy-in and some of the leadership from Aaron Rodgers. They did not feel like he was bought in last year. 
And now that was after they paid the money. That was the, the line was that he took the money and then checked out. Did not do what they expected him to do. And the little, the little bitty nugget from Breer was they felt like if he had shown up in the spring, things would have been different. The Packers feel that way. So all of that is to say, for whatever excuses you want to make about injuries last year, it is over this idea that Rodgers was just still Rodgers and everything was fine and it was everyone else's fault and it was the injury's fault. You know who doesn't believe that? The team that writes his checks. You know who else doesn't believe that? The team who wrote his checks last year. The team that gave him $150 million over three years. That team does not believe it was just the injuries. The team that traded two premium picks for him does does not believe does not believe that's all it was. They believe attitude played a role. And the, the stats show it. He was not he was not good. He was not good. And so the bar for Jordan Love, as I've said a million times on the show, you guys are going to get sick of hearing me say it. It's just not that high. All right, back tomorrow. More on Locked on Packers. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, you can do that on our YouTube page when we go live on YouTube. So you can stay Locked on Packers.